I'm sitting here in the blue room, the captain's room at uh, the Brother Roof of Thieves, and I'm talking here with Jamie Strobino. He is the uh, EVP, or he's running the place. And I was interested in talking to him because he started 103 restaurants. To start with, with the Hard Rock Cafe, we're going to talk about that. Then Not Your Average Joe and uh, a lot of other places and then we ending up here in the Brotherhood of Feast in Nantucket, a restaurant where I've been going for, for all my life since I've been here for about 25 years and now what basically what my goal is to find out what, had he, what did you learn about starting a restaurant about society, about people, about uh, how the society has changed, how health has changed, how eat food has changed. So Jamie thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. I just had here last Monday, we had here a fantastic dinner with all the people in this private room and we had great food. Of course, a lot of burgers. Yeah, oh yeah. Because yeah. your life, you're, you're the burgermeister. Uh, well, <laughs> you're the burgermeister and you started with the Hard Rock Cafe. Can you first tell me how you got into the Hard Rock Cafe business? Well, I, I, prior to that in college, I worked my way through actually working uh, as the bar manager of a Mexican restaurant and I moved to Washington, D.C and uh, became a GM of another little Mexican restaurant when I was 21. 21, you are and, a GM. Uh, okay. Yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting time. And <laughs> uh, from there, I went to work for TGI Fridays when they had uh, just 40 of them. They were still, whenever Fridays opened in the town, it was a big deal back then. Yeah. Uh, scratch kitchens, 200 plus items on the menu, very international in how they approach things. Um, Unbelievable education about how to run a business. Yeah. And uh, I opened uh, 10 of those um, and then spent my... Did you open Atlanta? Because I lived in Atlanta and I, I went to TGI Fridays. I did not open Atlanta, but uh, okay. you know, uh, a bunch in the Northeast. Um, and I spent time also uh, traveling, being a, a regional troubleshooter for them. So if there was a restaurant that either was transitioning or had some issues, I would go in for six weeks, work with the new GM or work with the team and get them ready and then then I would leave. Okay. Um, great gig. Yeah, yeah. And then... And, and what made you uh, so young a GM? What kind of qualities do you have? What, what, what are you good at that you always end up running a restaurant or opening a restaurant or being a troubleshooter? I was really lucky to have uh, good teams and folks that uh, you know, partnered in trying to drug, run the business. Um, a lot of folks that uh, had a lot more talent than me and just you kind of got to let them do their thing. So that was a great start. But, but what are you? Are you a really very tight organizer or do you have a vision of the place or can, are you really good with people or what, what does it make? What do you need uh, to become a GM? General well, I think to be, a, to be a good GM, I think you need to be uh, good with communication. You have to have a a set standard that you're a little uncompromising with and you have to have a clear vision of where you want to go. Mm -hmm. And um, through college I was involved in a lot of organizations uh, in leadership roles and from there it just kind of fit naturally into what I was doing. Um, and then uh, with Fridays after that uh, string of time I wound up going to work for the Hard Rock Cafe started in New York as uh, the manager in charge of bussers. Buses. And, and for uh, the people who don't know, know okay, what so buses buser, are. They're yeah. server assistants. They're the ones that clear the tables. And But you know, to me, it's about giving a sense of purpose. And so we took a group of 10 folks mm -hmm. um, from really all over the world. And I told them, if we're going to be the busser department, we're going to be the best there is. And we had little patches made up of Elvis Presley's TCB with a lightning bolt and instead of taking care of business we called it taking care of busing lightning quick mm -hmm. and so their whole role was to really go out there and knock it out of the park. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, five of those busters went on to become GMs of Hard Rocks. Oh really? <laughs> um, great crew, unbelievable talent to work with in New York City back then. Uh -huh. um, and, and how then, did you end up with these guys uh, at the Hard Rock Cafe? Because I, 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 I heard <coughs> they started, I mean I li listened to the story of the London version or something yep. like that because two guys started it there because they, they couldn't get a hamburger in London so they you said we You couldn't get a great it. burger in London. Yeah. Um, they were a couple of expats, Peter Morton and Isaac Tigert. Um, very, uh, very different 
Uh, Peter comes from a restaurant family, Wardens mm -hmm. of Chicago and the like, his father, Arnie. Um, Isaac uh, was in England and uh, really uh, involved in the music scene and very spiritual. Um, and so they created this restaurant uh, and it took off. A yeah. great place to go get burgers. And the first guitar they got was from Clapton. Eric Clapton. And yeah. uh, they gave it to him and you know, kind of partially, I guess, for free food and partially, you know, here, what do I do with it? Well, it's hanging on the wall. <coughs> from days, that moment on, we had everything well, from Jimi Hendrix. A uh, few days later, a guitar comes in with a note that says, mine's as good as his, Pete Townsend. <laughs> that gets put up on the wall. So that's kind of how it all began. And then from there, uh, it grew. And yeah. uh, Peter and Isaac... Uh, at, at some point um, split mm -hmm. and uh, Peter grew uh, hard rock cafes in the western half of the US and some other areas around the world and Isaac grew Europe and Eastern US and um, in Asia mm -hmm. and uh, and then from there they just kept growing and then we merged them all back together in really uh, 1996 so in time, and why was that? Because one of the people they they wanted to sell, or were they friends uh, well, again? Or so, uh, no, Peter was uh, had been very successful with what he was doing. He actually created the the, the Hard Rock uh, Casino in Las Vegas. Uh, Rank, who was the owner of Hard Rock, Isaac's part of the Hard Rock um, at that point in time, uh, had uh, sold a stake in Xerox and used the money to acquire the other half of the company from Peter. Mm. So then we were united and continued to grow from there. Today there's, you know, I don't even really know how many cafes, but they're into hotels and casinos and it's always been a lifestyle brand and it's branched ah, out. From TGI Fridays to this uh, hard work of AM. How did you get involved with them? Uh, so a couple of friends from Fridays had come to work there. Okay. And uh, I got a call. And I went in to meet them in New York. I was supposed to do a project for Fridays in New York, but I met these guys and I, I'd always taken my opening teams to the Hard Rock because we loved going there. Mm -hmm. And so we'd do a restaurant opening and on our off day, we'd go to New York and hit the Hard Rock. <laughs> and um, when I was uh, back and forth to Dallas where uh, Fridays was headquartered, uh, we had a training class at one time a group of us went to the Hard Rock down in uh, in Dallas and uh, had a, a wonderful experience. And from there, I'm like, you know what? I need to I need to work here. Uh -huh. So, um, what a great and, combination! And it was great. It yeah. was great to to get there early on and be involved in the growth of a company. Yeah. So you learned. I mean, but that's also TGI Fridays. You you, read, you learned how to have a formula and how mm -hmm. to how to protect the formula, and then you had the formula with the music. Yep. Because, of, of course, I mean, you've been in, I mean, now here in this, heart, <coughs> this brotherhood, you have every day, you have live music. So right, it's, still right. in your, uh, so, it's still in your soul. Excuse me one minute. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so the... Uh, it keeps on running, you keep on running yeah, the show, right? right? Yeah, no, you, want, you pay attention to every detail, <laughs> no, uh, still. It, after 100 free restaurants, it's still important? Yeah, uh, absolutely, you, you have to run the business, so... Um, but what I would tell you that, you know, you learn lessons as you go along in life and in business and you, it evolves. So everything that Fridays did didn't necessarily work with a company like the Hard Rock. Mm -hmm. Hard Rock had a lot more soul, had a lot more uh, passion for its people. Um, and it was more... Um, more about making a bigger impact in society mm -hmm. and so when we talk about love all serve all and take time to be kind that's a that's a mantra of how you should live your life mm -hmm. um, and the friendships that I made uh, with my teams in at Hard Rock uh, they endure you know 30 years later um, we opened Boston in 1989 that team is incredibly tight they still go to each other you know, they go to each other's weddings at, birth of the children, unfortunately now funerals, and um, there's still that connection mm. because it was part of something special. Yeah. So. And if you say that shaped me, that was really the big thing which shaped your... Uh, yeah, and I, and I think that, the, you know, we're in an industry that sometimes, at least in America, um, 
it gets maligned a bit because people feel like if I can't find a real job, I'll work in a restaurant. And uh, what they're missing is people uh, come to restaurants for different things, right? So you can come to a restaurant to get you know, sustenance. I'm hungry and I need to eat and fuel, so I get my fuel and then I go off. Mm -hmm. uh, some people come because they're looking for that connection to being around other people and they want that camaraderie. I, I view a restaurant as kind of a power station and you, you can plug in to get whatever you need. So if we're the oasis where you come to either rest or you want to have a quiet lunch on your own and read a book or you want to have a boisterous lunch or dinner with friends or you want to have a business meeting. I mean, people plug into the energy source in whatever way that they need and our job is to provide that energy. And the leader's job is to provide the energy to the team mm -hmm. because uh, you know you either bring the energy or you, you suck the energy out of it. And you, a successful leader will bring the energy. Yeah, because I, I've been talking to um, all my friends who work in restaurants. Mm -hmm. Normally the leader is an idiot who sucks the energy out of the team. <laughs> I mean, that's what, maybe that's the Netherlands, I don't know, but I mean, that's, no, it, it's, that's uh, what they have been saying very frankly in, in, in open conversations and hardly ever that they say, wow, this was, I've worked for a great leader and it's pretty, you know, like your hard rock cafe. Well, it, it depends. So, you know, depending where you're at in Europe, um, and I used to run the hard rocks in Europe, uh, the, you know, it's a profession uh, that people take seriously in mm -hmm. some countries. Um, you know, yeah, there's always the age old, somebody managed to survive and keep working and they're, they're a leader and they're not very good. Mm -hmm. um, there's a little more flexibility here with people who will, you know, <laughs> people who quit, quit their leader. They don't quit no. a business generally unless it's not running well. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that they quit is how they're being led. So that's the important thing is how you, how you treat people, how you inspire people, um, what you do to motivate them. Uh, those are all important facets as to why they want to stay and work. Because there are, as you know out there, there's a ton of jobs and not a ton of people to do the jobs. Mm -hmm. So if they're not happy and they can go across the street and they don't believe in what you're doing, they'll go across the street. You can control that or not. The yeah. choice is yours. So if you see a restaurant, they say we struggle with the amount, we struggle with personnel, we don't have enough uh, people mm -hmm. on, the, on the job, you immediately think, hey, it's the way the, thing is, the, the, the restaurant is run? Well, I think, I think it's part of it. Uh, you know, it, it, it's more challenging now. The restaurants are a very demanding business. It's long hours. We work when people want to play. And so, if people, you have to be wired a certain way to be uh, into hospitality. And if you're not wired that way, if that's not what you're passionate about, then this isn't the business for you. Mm -hmm. And too often, you have people that uh, take jobs in restaurants and they don't really take it for the right reason or they don't maximize what they could get out of it. Mm -hmm. And so if you love hospitality and if you're passionate about people, uh, this is a great business to be in and you can bring joy to however we do 800 guests a day here you know that we have 800 opportunities to make a difference um and it's a, in in today's world with everything going on and without you really knowing what's going on in someone else's life uh you could very well be the difference between a good day or a bad day or you know, kind of give them a little inspiration to keep going. Yeah, no, this, so. uh, this is a place, if we go here, we're excited to go, mm -hmm. we're excited to be here, and we're excited to, be, to have been here. Right. And we have fun talking to the, talking to the waitress, and, and uh, she always loves to tell a story, so she is interested, and so if yep. we are interested, she's interested too, she has the time and that kind of stuff, so. It's a connection, it's a connection, so that's. It can be more than food, <clears throat> yeah. It can be much more than food. Agreed. So um, I, I think uh, those that can tap into that energy and that passion can be very successful in this business. Mm -hmm. um, those that uh, just kind of roll along for the ride, you, you're not long for the ride. It's just, eventually it'll catch up to you. So 
when you talk about a bad leader, it's someone that's not making the investment they need to make in their people, my opinion. Okay, very clear. Why did you ever leave the hard work? I mean, you were there, it had a soul. So it's an interesting story. I, I um, we had a, a we had our son, he was a, a premature. Um, I was traveling like crazy. Yeah. And I was in between two restaurant openings. And I had everything planned so that when he was due, was smack in the middle, it would have given me plenty of time. And I was in Texas on my way to New Orleans when my pager went off. This is the old days of beepers. Yeah. And uh, it was a, a note to call home. So I used the air phone, couldn't get it to work, landed in New Orleans, turned on my big cell phone back then. And uh, my wife called and said, uh, my water broke, you, ha you, have, to, you have to come home. Mm. And uh, I immediately called our travel person, managed to make it back, long story short. Yeah. We had my son. Well, at the same time, uh, we had a huge project going on in Orlando and they were really like, we really need you to come down and work on this project, can you help us? I was living in Boston at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was the only vice president that wasn't in Orlando. So they're asking, <laughs> uh, I'm in the middle of, you know, we just, you know, my son's still in the NICU at the time. And we brought him home. And uh, I said to the boss, I, I really can't move to Orlando right now. I said, too much going on. Our whole support system's here. Yeah. We're not going to uproot the family. But I'll commute. So I commuted for commuted for 10 months to Orlando. Oh. Um, and from Orlando, I would go do project meetings, visit restaurants in America, or get on a plane to go to Europe, or when I had to, do a two-week trip to Asia. But after a while, um, I came, uh, came to the realization that I need to move to Orlando. I can't keep doing this. So we moved. Mm. And... I said to my wife when we moved, let's run out our house. We'll try it for a year. If you hate it, I'll quit. And um, there were, you know, she never at any given time said she was unhappy. She supported me through the whole thing. We've been together 35 years. You're still together. Um, yep. And, uh, and so after about 11 months, uh, I met, uh, I'd been involved with, uh, uh, um, a really famous recruiter here called Alice Elia in, in, in our industry in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had also gone to stu study Seven Habits of Highly Effective People in Utah with Stephen Covey. Yeah. And I came away from there realizing my legacy is not going to be... It's your, letter, it's your letter to the right wall. Right. Yeah. So my legacy is going to be my family. Mm -hmm. So I came home. Alice called. Asked me what she asked me every year, are you happy? And I said, you know what, for the first time I'm not. So after almost 11 years, I uh, packed it up and connected with Steve, uh, who is the founder of Not Your Average Joe's, back here in Massachusetts so we can move back into our house. Mm. And, um, and from there, we grew that little company, a restaurant at a time, raising money and how many, were, how many Joes were there? Well, at that time there were two, so two. people thought I was crazy leaving Hard Rock, hard rock to go to a little not two, your two restaurant yeah, yeah. startup. Yeah. But um, I was 37, and I thought now's the time to try it. So uh, we spent 20 years building that thing to over 25 restaurants. It's still a, a very good company. Still based here in Massachusetts, now in six states. Um, and around a Four years ago now, Steve uh, stepped away as the CEO. I stayed for another year and a half working with the team that we brought in. And then uh, when the Black Whale was acquired, I stepped away and went to work with the Black Whale. Okay. So, and then from there, we've got our company, Served Well, which is now six restaurants strong. And um, this is a project that we kind of fell into and uh, we were asked yeah. to run it. But let's, uh, before we do that, let's first evaluate uh, mm -hmm. this not your average job. You yep. went from two to 20 <coughs> restaurants. You were there in the beginning, yep. and, uh, and you built it one at a time. What, what is completely different, more local? You had, you, uh, had so a family, was, you had a family. What did you learn from that experience? I learned that um, there's a, 
a desperate need of better food uh, in the suburbs. Um, you can build a small restaurant in a local area and be very successful. Uh, I liked that I was able to find balance and have time to be there for sports and school events and dance recitals. And I was even on the school committee for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, so a chance to really re-engage and be involved with the family, watching them grow. So mm -hmm. I have absolutely no regrets. We have two wonderful uh, kids. Uh, our daughter is a... Uh, just graduated Rhode Island School of Design with her master's, and my son Ian is a professional musician in Nashville. So, was worth the time. Putting uh, it in. Time flies. So, and that was really worth it. So, here we are. Uh, Joe's grew very happy with what we did. We took a lot of the principles and values from Hard Rock and from Fridays, and and then we added in a really great guest obsessed focus. Um, to how we built our business there. So it was a, a really different uh, mindset for a lot of the staff to embrace. The, the, guest, the guest always wins, they're not always right, but, um, and if they're disrespectful, we'll protect and stand up for our staff. Mm -hmm. um, but if the guest thinks that they ordered something and you know that they didn't, it's not worth it getting into an argument with them. No. Just, let them win. You're not going to hurt the company. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you can let go and embrace that, it's freeing. You're not hung up on trying to defend your position. Mm -hmm. You know you're okay. Yeah. Well, if you back so, if you back the staff with that statement, yep. then it's easier to do that. I mean, well, uh, we we tell our staff there they're obligated to solve problems for the guest, mm -hmm. and we're obligated to support them in doing that. And there's nothing they will do. To hurt the company except to have too unhappy of a guest hmm. that's the big thing that i worry about what, what has changed in all these years if you see when you started like uh, 30 years ago and uh, and now what 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 changed in society what changed in people what changed in guests what well changed I, in, uh, i think guests are a lot less patient than they've been in the past um do we need to end i can i'm doing something stupid mm. So I think guests are uh, um, a lot less patient. Um, I think COVID has caused people to lose some of their social skills. Mm. Um, I feel that with the staff, uh, I think everybody, everybody is maybe a little more thin skinned than they need to be. Mm. Um, and by that I mean, uh, any kind of uh, feedback or criticism, um, people might be a little too, it, it's not designed to tear someone down or to uh, undermine who they are. Mm -hmm. It's really designed to try to help them reach their potential. Yeah, don't take it personal. Um, yeah, well, and I can see where, where managers go about it the wrong way is when it becomes an attack, and so then it does become personal. Um, but if, it's, if you stick to specifics, and you focus on what they need to work on, um, and you admit whether you've made a mistake or not, uh, I think that's important. And so what I have found is you have guests that have a lot less patience right now than they've had in the past. Um, you have staff that uh, knows they can bounce around and get a job somewhere else because a lot of businesses are desperate for staff. Mm -hmm. um, and you really have to rethink how you treat them and what you do. Um, in the past, it was if they don't want to do the job, there's someone else right outside the door that'll do the job, and it's it kind of kept things a little more, you know, a, a pressure balance at work. Um, now that's different. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's uh, more about how do you help people find balance. And frankly, one of the things I think that's great is there's a lot of people now that are, are very concerned about balance in life and how do they how do they keep it balanced. Even in America. <laughs> Less because so we in know, America. We know, that, in, so we know America. that in Europe, but I mean, America. We know still, it's interesting. I mean, before you talked about in Europe, they might get paid more per hour and a smaller amount of tip. Way um, less. Yeah. 
in America, there's more tip, less per hour. You know, there's a lot about America that we uh, do right, and there's a lot that we could do better. And I feel like uh, take our healthcare system or our education system. Um, when we talk to people that want to complain about taxes, and I look at what someone in Holland or Denmark is paying in taxes, it's a lot more than we pay. Mm -hmm. However, they're not walking around with hundreds of thousands of dollars in student debt. They're not walking around worrying about health care and how much they have to co-pay. No. Um, they're not worried about their retirement. So I look at some of the structure that's happened over the years, and by the time you figure out what it costs you for your co-pay for your medical, and then your extra payments once you get your medical and your, and your prescriptions, and what you're paying for education, mm -hmm. when you really boil it down, we're probably paying almost the same, but we're working harder and convincing ourselves that you know, we're better off without all the taxes. Um, it, it's a really interesting thing to look at, and I feel like having had the privilege to spend more time overseas, um, you begin to understand more about how they run things. Um, yeah, I've got a friend that works for a German company. They, the, the German subsidiary has their six weeks off. The American one has two weeks a year. And, yeah. um, but it, it's very interesting. That's just how it rolls. And yeah, but it's also, I mean, it's in the people because I had a company here. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, guys, everybody has four weeks vacation, you know, just from the bat. You come to right. work for me, four weeks vacation. At the end of the year, I had to really hard on work saying, you're going to take a week vacation. You're going to take yeah. a week vacation. Because they did, not, they did not take the vacation. They were just not used to it. It's really... Well, I think it's part not used to it and part uh, out of concern that they don't want to be viewed as not a valuable player. And so it gets hard for people because you... You get you. You can become insecure. Like, mm -hmm. geez, if I'm away, is everything going to be okay if I'm away? Yeah. You know what? Everything might not be okay if you're yeah, away. Yeah, but I mean, but that's why I was there as the leader, saying, "This is okay. Yeah. This is good to do." I mean, after two years, they got it, and then I, they didn't have a problem anymore. They had a problem if they left me and, yeah, yeah. and went to another company. They say, "Oh man, this was just like." But it's, I mean, there's people who are 45 years old and they start another job and they, they get two weeks of holiday. I mean, it's yeah. just what kind of... Really so anyway, that is, that is the American way. Interesting in that respect, um, here it's the norm. You, you get $10 an hour and you get $30 in tip if you're a waitress, if you're a waiter or a waiter. So Thereabouts, like yeah. The, the, the tip wage in Massachusetts, I believe, is... I want to say six something right now, six fifty-five. We pay a little more uh, out here on the island because it's harder to. Yeah. Okay, but I mean, you have a small amount of pay. Yep. Uh, the majority it, it, is it's almost your under. It's under the minimum wage. Uh, you you get paid, and then for, and on top of that, you get tip, and then you get a huge. You get a nice. Uh, if the restaurant is is doing good, you have a fantastic business. Right. In Europe, it's maybe a quarter tip and three quarters uh, fixed yeah. salary. And also, what they do in Europe a lot of times, they take the tip, put it all together, and also the person uh, who's cleaning the dishes and who's, who's, who's getting the tables done, it's all a team. Right. You, what is your experience? What so works? Here, so they've tried that in a few places. Um, most recently, Zuni Cafe in San Francisco has decided they want to go back to the old system. Um, what's interesting is, the, the original argument about tip credit and all of that, um, I believe America needs uh, a higher minimum wage. Uh, I also believe in our industry, most of them, at least in the Northeast, are already paying a higher wage than the minimum. So mm -hmm. you know, I can't think of a restaurant out there that has an employee that's making $14 an hour um, you know, as a Not host or as a dishwasher or as whatever. Mm -hmm. um, even before, actually, because if you want to be competitive, you have to be competitive. Um, the tip credit's an interesting thing. Because of the way America tips, um, the tip credit was the one thing that allowed restaurant folks, <coughs> restaurant tours, to be able to have a little flexibility on trying to manage their costs and their profits. Um, we're in an industry that, you know, 
uses a lot of utilities, has a high real estate cost, has a high labor cost, uh, you've got a high food cost. So the end result is not a big profit margin when you run a restaurant. Um, the interesting thing about raising the tip credit was that you know we need to raise the minimum wage so we raise the tip credit to make sure they make it mm -hmm. but the way the tip credit works is if you're declaring your tips um, I have to make sure you make at least a minimum wage so if you if you have 10 hours of work and let's say I pay you ten dollars an hour and minimum wage is 15 yeah. and you only declare three dollars an hour on average in tips then I still have to pay in $2 more an hour mm -hmm. to make sure you make it to minimum. That gets lost on a lot of people. They don't understand that that's what happens. So you've got this mindset that, um, you know, by taking tip credit, we're not paying minimum. We actually Oh, are. no, I, I don't have that problem. It's more about motivating people, that people are motivated to work, and also the, the team, you know, the, 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 the people who take the things to the table and off yep. the table and to clean it. How, because I got the impression uh, you can maybe get $15, million, uh, 15 an hour if you're, uh, if you're cleaning the dishes, mm -hmm. but you get $35 an hour if you're, it, it's much better to be near the client, it's better to near the tip, the tip uh, income. Well, the, it, it's a different skill set. So just like in any industry, yeah. um, mm -hmm. this is a higher skill required to be out front waiting on tables, interacting with the guests, being organized with handling cash, being organized with ringing in orders and knowing your menu and everything else. Um, I can tell you the you know, dishwashers are the most important person in the restaurant because if you don't have those, you feel it. And <coughs> I can also tell you that, um, again, you got to take care of those guys and gals. They're the ones that are going to make a difference for you. Um, but at the same token, you know, there, there's a, a level that you would pay for a skill set. So a higher skill set is going to get paid more money. Mm -hmm. a, a really good grill cook is invaluable to you. Um, so they're going to make more than a dishwasher is going to make sure. because they've had to learn it and work it and understand how it goes. Of course. Um, but a dishwasher can grow to be whatever they want to be. Um, I mean, this industry is full of folks who started out as dishwashers. I started out as a dishwasher when I was 16. Mm -hmm. So my feeling is um, the skill level gets paid in accordance with where it should be. And so you're pretty happy with the system, uh, the way it works? I, I think it works. I, uh, I think it works, and I think the, the, the poor leaders don't know how to help their people maximize what they can make. Okay. And I say to a server in America, the difference, because having run a few places in Europe, if you have a section, let's call this, this is your section, mm -hmm. and you've got four tables, you need to think of it as an independent contractor. I'm basically giving you a space to work, providing you with clients. You can make as little or as much as you want to make, depending on how you want to interact. Mm -hmm. You just want to take orders and bring food out, and that's it. You'll make your 16 to 20%, whatever. You want to blow them away, people can be very generous when they feel they're blown away. Mm -hmm. And I've seen servers with fewer tables make more money than servers with more tables because they're better with their guests. Yeah. The guests, so in, Amer in America at least, they get rewarded. Yeah, now, and people in America love to give tips if they are really happy. Yes. They think it's really important and they, li they like to have a relationship. So in that respect, it's a little different than, uh, than your. But I mean, it's also how we keep prices manageable for folks too when you go out to eat. So um, menus can get very expensive very quickly if you're adding in a bunch of other costs. So if you keep your labor managed, then you can afford to sell something for less money than somebody else. Yeah. Let's talk about, you talked already about it for a little bit, COVID. You know, mm -hmm. It changed people, it changed guests, it changed <laughs> people who worked there. <coughs> how, how did you survive that period? It was very scary. Um, we had the original Joe's and we had the Black Whale at the time. The original Joe's had always done takeout business, so we had closed 
the black whale for a few weeks to try to figure things out. We kept all the managers employed and moved them to um, Nine Average Joe's or the original Joe's to uh, help with takeout and the like. Mm -hmm. um, we set up a, a little fund where uh, staff could come get family meals for their families uh, each week um, until we worked our way through it. And we built a business. So we took what was, um, you know, a million dollar a year to go business uh, to on an annual basis was closer to three. Mm -hmm. um, and we, through it all, we, we got creative. Okay, how do I do curbside? How do I make sure people feel safe? How do I, right? All of that was going on the entire time. And after about a month, we were, okay, we got a plan. We're going to open the whale. The whale, who had never done any takeout, really, um, itself grew uh, extremely quickly um, into a business that was self-sustaining. Hmm. Um, our pricing structure was changed around. We did a lot of things differently, but we did it to try to really drive, um, just keep the lights on. Yeah. You just have to keep the lights on. And there were a lot of people in our business who um, just gave up. It was, you know, they didn't want to deal with it. It was too big a challenge, didn't want to do whatever else. We looked at it and thought we have an obligation to our teams to um, try to figure out how do we keep everybody employed? How do we keep this thing going? So never spoil a good crisis? I mean, well, uh, now, that, now, that, now that you have, now that the problem is away or it's, it's more in the background, what has stayed? I guess I will tell you, there was a speaker that uh, I met um, and his, his line that has always stuck with me is adversity is a terrible thing to waste. And, um, it couldn't be more true. Mm. Um, and uh, and I, you know, I'm drawing a blank on his name now, which is embarrassing. He was a, a, a POW in Vietnam. And he talked about being in his cell and just thinking, what do you do with this? How do you get out? And um, mm -hmm. so yeah, adversity is a terrible thing to waste because you can learn a lot from it. Yeah. Um, so so what, did, what has stuck? What has stuck, what has stuck is, um, Probably a little more patient. Uh, certainly, being appreciative of your people is important. Um, I think being there for the guest is important. Uh, it's always an interesting time. You know, uh, when when nine eleven hit, uh, we made the decision to keep uh, our restaurants open that night. And we had a couple staff members that were very upset that we did that. Yet we had a, an amazing amount of guests that just wanted to go be with someone. And so they came and they gathered at our places. And that's kind of what we are. Mm -hmm. We're there for the people when they need us. So with COVID post now, I think, you know, that gets to where I think people are a little less, um, social skills need to get a little better. Feel like we, we we're forgetting that we're dealing with each other and with humans and you know it's it's you, you can take time to be kind it's you know a mistake yeah, it, is not it, it the was end on of the your, world it was on your menu all the time yeah actually, so that it only got reinforced what about takeout is that has that become a more stronger business uh takeout is starting to kind of settle back down it's still People are more used to doing takeout, That's but it's not at the level it was during COVID, no. No, okay. <clears throat> about the um, things which have changed too is the uh, discussion about food. Mm -hmm. I mean, you started with fries, uh, TJ was fries, burgers, fat, that kind of stuff. Wait, how, uh, how has that, uh, did, did, you, did, you <clears throat> change, uh, did you change your menus uh, over time to become more to, to help the guests who wanted to eat more healthy? Well, I think um, things evolve, right? So we have a Simply Grilled section on a lot of our menus, um, which enables the guests to kind of compose what they want. Um, you know, people, what I've learned over the years is, you know, people that want to eat a healthier diet, um, we need to have options for them. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to be the one that's trying to cram one down their throats. They. You know, there's, there's always the person that's going to want the burger. Um, 
there's always the person that's going to want a good salad. Um, there's a person that's going to want a great vegetarian dish that they can get. Um, but trying. did that change over the last 20, 30 years? I think there's more awareness of allergies. I think there's more awareness of trying to eat healthier. Um, still sell a surprising amount of fries and burgers. <laughs> yeah. So, um, hands down, it's the number one seller. It's also, if you go here, you want to have a, sin, a sinful evening. You, you're not going for the, exactly. the, the healthy... Exactly. You know, but yeah. if, you, if someone in the party wants to be healthy... He can. Or healthier. Can. Yeah. So, our, our whole thing, which has never changed, is best quality ingredients, well prepared and seasoned, at the lowest price we can do. Mm -hmm. So... Um, we always tell our crew, we want to make friends today and we'll make the money tomorrow. It's mm -hmm. more important to me to make friends. Well, we're here now at the last restaurant you opened. That is the, uh, the Brotherhood, which is a famous restaurant in Nantucket, which was closed uh, during COVID and, and stayed closed for, uh, for a while. Can you talk to me how you got involved in this restaurant? How, the, how this opportunity came well, about? Well, the, the owners of the building, um, or a group of folks from out here on the Nantucket, um, and, and one of them from Cisco Brewers, who we've had dealings with for years, and we also had a little partnership with in New Bedford with the Cisco Kitchen and Bar. Um, and they, they really liked how we run the businesses, and they asked us if we would come here and run this business, would we partner with them? Mm. And Steve and I have always loved Nantucket and always had a thing for the Brotherhood. It's just one of, it was an institution. He knew it forever, okay. Yeah, so we thought, well, when's this opportunity ever going to come yeah. up again? No. <laughs> and so we embarked on a project. We started this project last summer, um, finalized the deal in the fall when the building got acquired and then got it built out during the winter and spring here we opened part of it the brotherhood part on memorial day and then we've grown it bit by bit ever since mm -hmm. so it's always been a uh a unique um project for us and what's the same and what's different between the old brotherhood and now and this one? Uh, the old brotherhood downstairs was sandwiches and uh, a lot more sandwiches. Um, hamburgers. Yeah. <laughs> Lots so of hamburgers. We've kept, we've kept the pub as close as we can to what it was. We've upgraded a few things. We've made the seating softer. We've cleaned it up a bit. Um, but we've kept the menu pretty true to what the brotherhood was, just mm -hmm. more modernized after 50 years. And then... Upstairs, which in the old brotherhood was really just a kind of bunch of rooms, we opened up and did this Cisco surf bar in, kind of like our Cisco we have in New Bedford. Uh, brought sushi yeah. over. Um, I like that. Yeah, and our That's sushi, we have an uh, unbelievable sushi program, and we've done it in, in the Black Whale and in Cisco, New Bedford, now here. Um, we took a very nice bar that they had in the front and we just raised the bar and we turned it into an upscale whiskey bar, um, decorated accordingly, um, built to give you the feel of your stepping back a bit in time to go into a really great whiskey bar mm. um, with curated cocktails and whiskeys and things you're not going to find everywhere. So we um, turned it into that. So now you've got three distinct areas and then we did a patio outside that we kind of turned into like a hop beer garden. Um, not a traditional beer garden in a sense where we're running out a bunch of beer and you're getting pretzels and sitting around, but more of a, you feel like you're kind of in a garden. And um, that menu runs the one with sushi on it as well. Uh, so all of them have slowly coalesced into um, a complex that we're very happy with. Uh, 250 seats when it's really going and um, it's and 800 people a day 
800 people a day. 800 yeah. people a day. And so, and the team you uh, and the team and the cook. Uh, where, where did, he, did was that the old team or was that the new team? Whole new team. Um, we hired uh, at one point over a hundred cook. I mean, over a hundred employees. Um, we've had to house quite a few of them, but it's been. Um, yeah. It's been a challenge, uh, particularly out here in Nantucket. Nantucket's notoriously difficult to staff, and you've got a massive housing problem out yeah. here. Mm -hmm. And so, um, how did you fix that, the housing problem? Well, we don't have it fixed. We have, you know, we we still could use quite a few more employees, but what we have is we have some rooms and we work with what we have. But um, in an ideal world, we'd have a lot more. So kind of where so we're at. To, to take care of 800 people, how many people do you need? How many staff do you need? Uh, a day? Well, a, a day. So we have, if all dining rooms are open, we'll run 45 people a shift. Mm -hmm. And two shifts a day? Yeah. Okay. 90 people, 90 people a day. Yeah. yeah. Or 90 shifts. So yeah. some will do doubles and the like, but still, it's it's a it's it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we've been fortunate. Uh, the tricky part for Nantucket will start happening soon. In in August, you know, people start heading back to school, so you're going to lose that crew, and it gets trickier as you go. How many months do you have to make the business? Is it from from June to September, or is it? Is well, there's month? shoulder seasons now, but there's the bulk of your business is from June to November. I mean, June to September. June. To um, however, what we have found is uh, there are um, a number of uh, opportunities in the shoulder seasons, and so we really we really view this as a year-round business. Mm. A lot of places out here don't. They close and go home for the winter and relax. And what kind of opportunities are there? What kind of things do you do next to uh, to try to grow the business? Yeah. So what are what are what are events? I mean, there's some events here on the. Oh yeah, yeah. Docket. So they, they run. What are these? There's um, Christmas stroll, which is the whole town's decorated, and it's a fun weekend in December, and it's summertime level of volume for a weekend in the middle of December. Um, in the spring, you've got Daffodil Weekend, you've got um, the Film Festival, the Book Festival, the Comedy Festival, um, the Wine Festival is a really big event here. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting how it all goes. Um, so. Okay. The 103rd restaurants. Yep. I mean, you you live here next door. Yeah. In, in the basement, your family still lives uh, off island. Well, my wife comes back and forth. Uh, my daughter is uh, on island for the summer, and uh, my son is in Nashville. Yeah. So. And I saw you here. I came in here, and you still were putting chairs back in here. And this, you were still organizing. <laughs> You're still. After 103 restaurants, you're still pretty passionate, are you? It's, uh, I love what I do. And it's, um, it's, I'm always seeing things that might not be as they should be. That yeah. always kind of. Yeah, I asked your personnel, is he a micromanager? They said, no, he, he really knows what he wants and he wants it good, but he also can trust other people, but he really wants things the right way. You have this. Yeah. You still have this vision of what you want to, what you, how you want the place to be. We have an obligation to give the guests a great experience, and you can't do that if you're not prepared. So, having it a certain way helps us be prepared. And if we do that, then we're gold. Yeah. This restaurant, you uh, we are <coughs> very busy. The last thing we talk about, and we mm -hmm. stop. Um, I went to, for the first time, in the brewery, uh, the, the Cisco Brewery, and it was just a lot of events happening and live music and lots of different kinds of uh, kitchens which you can enjoy. And you had also a vision of what the Brotherhood could be to, to bring that a little bit downtown. How was that uh, when you basically came up with these exciting ideas and you exposed them to, uh, to the community? Well, I, I think the, the, 
the tricky part is we, we don't really want to bring the brewery downtown. What we want to bring is the spirit of the brewery downtown, which is fun, opportunity. Excuse me one minute. You know what? They can, they can cash out with their server downstairs. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. So the, what we're trying to do is to um, bring that spirit of camaraderie and fun um, here. Mm-hmm. <coughs> we can't replicate the brewery here. It's you know, impossible. No. But um, that concept of, and lifestyle of just fun and uh, camaraderie and just, just kind of chilling is what we try to do. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, a, it's a very unique space out there. Um, closest I've come to the old hard rock passion uh, in, in many years. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that kind of vibe. And when you wanted to bring that here, in the, 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 they, they were, people were afraid of that it would well, I think be too would, loud or... Uh, that's what I, you know, we're on the edge of a, of a uh, we're in the business district, but we're kind of towards the end of the business district. And there were a lot of folks that were fearful that it was just going to be a big party and loud, and which wasn't our intention. And as they've seen by how we're operating, not what we're doing. Mm-hmm. But... You know, some people get it in their heads that they think that's what it's going to be, and it's really hard to get them to turn their head around. Yeah. So all we can do is, you know, stick stick to what we committed to stick to, do a good job. They'll come around. Earn trust. Yeah, exactly. Earn trust with the guests, with the people, and with the community. Exactly. Thanks very much, Jamie. Hey, my pleasure. <laughs> it's so good spending time with you. Have a good day. I will. Oh, you got any, how many more of these do you have to do today? Well, you, uh, I, this is the first one I do in. Uh, this is the first one I do in um, in my vacation. Excellent. But I'm going now. I happen to go now to 